and let's get going. Okay, so welcome to the EL MOOC summer session. The EL MOOC is back. I am Claudia Musekamp and I will be hosting today's session. After long uh, weeks um, with the EL MOOC, ELD MOOC till from February till May. All of us deserved a break, but now we are back to a series of summer session with practitioners from all around the world. And today I'm very happy to have Robert, Mr. Robert Constanza aboard, who is the chair in public policy at the Crawford School of Public Policy of the Australian National University. Um, Robert Constanza is also an editor-in-chief at the Solutions um, magazine. And so welcome with me, uh, Bob Constanza. Welcome. Hello, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Bob will share his views and his um, uh, that he also published in his latest papers on changes in the global value of ecosystem services. So thank you, Bob, and I hand over to you. Okay, thanks, Claudia. Yeah. Um, so um, we'll we'll get going. Um, the first slide. Let's see if this works. Yes. So <clears throat> I'll talk a bit of. Oops. Too many talk a bit about um, this paper that we just published in Global Environmental Change, where we tried to estimate the, the changes in the global value of ecosystem services. Um, you, I'm sure you all know <clears throat> what ecosystem services are by now. Um, this is the Millennium Assessment Diagram showing uh, the four basic uh, groups, uh, provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services, and their connections to the various constituents of human well-being. So ecosystem services are the, the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems. But I think there's something missing from this diagram, an important thing, that is the, in order for these benefits to actually occur, um, there has to be an interaction with the other uh, forms of capital assets. And uh, let's see, yes, as this diagram shows, um, that you have natural capital interacting with social capital, with human capital, with built capital, and that, that produces sustainable human well-being. So it's not natural capital flowing directly into human well-being, but some complex interaction between these four basic types of, of uh, capital assets uh, that's, that's required for... Um, ecosystem services uh, to occur. This basically um, means that to study ecosystem services um, is, a, is a very transdisciplinary uh, kind of study. It's not something that ecologists could, can do by themselves. Um, you know, ecologists can study how natural systems function, but the whole idea of ecosystem services is how does that functioning actually benefit and sustain human well-being. And to understand that, you have to understand humans, individual people, human capital. You have to understand their communities and their built infrastructure and how all those pieces uh, come together. So I think that's, uh, it's a challenge. It's certainly a challenge for the way universities are generally structured along the disciplinary lines, but I think that's a challenge that we, um, and the, the ELD project in particular, and, uh, and many others are, are beginning to take up. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, and uh, before going any further, let me just point out some mistaken identities about ecosystem services and, and economics more generally. Um, these things keep cropping up, so I thought it'd be good to, to just uh, refresh our memories there that you know, economics is not equal to the market. The market is just one institution that we have for managing our, our assets, and that's really what economics should be about, you know, the broader conception of how um, how all these assets contribute to human well-being, as the previous diagram showed. So you can't really study economics properly, I think, without studying all of those assets, and many of them are outside the market, like our natural and social capital assets. Um, it's important to value these, these assets in terms of trying to understand their relative contribution to human well-being. 
And that's not the same thing as privatizing, commodifying, or trading those assets in, uh, in markets. It's really about understanding that interaction that I showed in the, in the previous diagram. <clears throat> Um, and you can express those values in, in many ways. And uh, one of those ways is in monetary units. And it could be in other units as well. You, know, you can use um, almost anything that's involved in that interaction as a common denominator. And, but <clears throat> expressing these values in monetary units is, is uh, e it's easy for many people to understand because they, they, uh, they deal with money in, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and they don't deal with other things that you could express those values in, like energy or land or time or, or any of a number of other, other units. But so expressing these values in monetary units is for communication purposes, and it doesn't equal market or exchange values. In fact, many of the, the valuation estimates that I'll be talking about don't come from either real or, or even hypothetical markets. Uh, but that are based on other ways of estimating that contribution to human well-being. So we've got those things taken care of. There's a, <clears throat> a range of uses for this valuation of ecosystem services um, that this table shows, including simply raising awareness and interest about the magnitude of the, this value. And that's largely what this paper that I'll be describing more uh, talks about, is how to how do we <clears throat> understand at least approximately the relative magnitude of these, these contributions to, uh, to human well-being you know, at the global scale? Um, <clears throat> there's no particular um, you know, decision framework that that, that, that uh, goes into. It's really more uh, a sort of general understanding. But <clears throat> all of the individual values that, that go into that uh, are certainly useful for a number of other purposes, including modifying national income and well-being accounts. This is, this is something that many countries are currently involved with, including Australia, um, for uh, better evaluating specific policies and land use plans, uh, for um, payment for ecosystem services, for uh, full cost accounting uh, in businesses. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these other uses as well after I've touched on the, the, um, the results from the, from the paper. And, and also a bit about um, the kinds of institutions that we may need to create uh, to better manage ecosystems uh, because they are not uh, private goods, they're public goods, and we may need, need uh, uh, other institutions besides the market, um, things like common asset trusts to do a better job of managing them. Okay, let's go to the next slide if I can. Come on. No. Okay, so there's a range of valuation techniques that have been used, and there's no one right way to estimate these values because these services are complex, and there's a, there's a whole range of techniques. Um, <clears throat> this is really just a partial list as well, uh, but you can see a couple at the top: avoided cost and replacement cost, uh, are not not directly uh, dependent on people's perceptions of the values. Uh, but they're, you know, what would we have to pay to replace those services? And I won't go into details on these other uh, techniques. You probably run across them. Contingent valuation is kind of a pseudo market uh, technique. But <clears throat> down at the bottom, there's a couple of others that I think are uh, beginning to gain some uh, uh, some use. This idea of group valuation, that if you're talking about valuing uh, public goods <clears throat> rather than private goods, it might be better to ask the public how they value those, those goods and do that in a more deliberative kind of process. And um, this idea of marginal product estimation, some of these good, um, services <clears throat> we, uh, we really can't expect the public to know much about. So we have to build models of how they interact with human well-being and then uh, use those models to help us estimate what the con contribution uh, of those services is. Okay. So uh, for many kinds of studies, it's necessary to aggregate these values from more site-specific uh, studies up to uh, regional watershed, um, you know, or, or even the global scale, as I'll talk about. And this is a, a range of techniques that can be used for that. This idea of basic value transfer, which is the technique that we used in the 1997 paper in Nature, and this update that I'll talk about. Um, it assumes a, a constant value 
over uh, each ecosystem type and simply multiplies uh, this average value times the, the area of each ecosystem in a, in a way sort of analogous to the way you know price times quantity gives you the, the value in GDP accounting. Um, <clears throat> of course we know that that's an approximation and in fact all of these are approximations. All models are, are simply approximations. Um, but you can do a better approximation if you have experts adjust those values uh, for ecosystem conditions. And you could say that not all forests are equally productive of many of these services. Um, <clears throat> we can survey experts and see how those, those uh, contributions vary. Um, if we have enough studies, we could build a statistical model that can help explain the variation in the value estimates based on other characteristics. Uh, the size of the of the area of the, the forest, for example, um, <clears throat> the uh, proximity to population, etc. Um, and finally, we could build more spatially explicit and functional models of these systems, uh, complex systems models. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of these at the end. So, um, of course, we know that the interest in ecosystem services has been growing exponentially over the last several decades. This is just a plot of the number of papers that have been published. And this hasn't really been updated except, um, too recently, but uh, there's about now more than 10,000 papers that have been published on this topic in the scientific literature. Um, <clears throat> so this you know, interest is growing rapidly. Now the is this time to like here? The, the most highly cited of these papers is this one that we published back in 1997, where we tried to estimate the value of the global ecosystem services, breaking it down into 17 different services across 16 different biomes. And we came up with you know, numbers in the range of 16 to 54 trillion dollars a year, much larger than global GDP at the time. Um, <clears throat> now, what we've done Okay, and this is this is a summary of those values. Again, there's 17 different services, um, and the, the middle column here shows the um, average value per hectare per year, uh, adding up all 17 of those services, and then arrayed against the area of each biome <clears throat> and the, the product in the right-hand column. You get to the total of, on average, around 33, 33 trillion. So it's a simple benefit transfer approach, but but I think um, <clears throat> about the best we could do at the time. Now since then, as part of the TEEP study, that's the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, um, there's been a, um, <clears throat> uh, an assessment and a, and a collection of a lot of additional studies that have been published since then uh, for each of these ecosystems and for all of the 17 or more different, uh, different services. Uh, so this paper that uh, Rudolf de Groot was the the first author on uh, this shows the <clears throat> the sort of uh, mean and and range of values uh, for each of these ecosystems and in parentheses here the the number of studies that that was that was based on so we can use these updated estimates in combination with and this is a <clears throat> um, another way of showing uh, the uh, the range of values and the number of studies that were a number of estimates that went into each one. So there's there's been quite a lot of additional research that's gone on to uh, uh, increase our knowledge of these services, and some of them have, been, have increased quite dramatically. Coral reefs, for example, for example, there have been 94 uh, estimates of the value of coral reefs, and uh, <clears throat> you know they range from you know, thirty-six thousand dollars per hectare per year to, to uh, well over a couple of million dollars per hectare per year. Um, <clears throat> so one of the more valuable, uh, in, in terms of intensity anyway, uh, ecosystems on the planet. Um, so what we did was take these additional estimates. And <clears throat> I know you can't see any of the numbers on this. This is just to show you the, the sort of the spreadsheet that we entered all of these things into. And we have the the areas of the biomes over here, and for each service, uh, what the value was in 1997, what the updated value was in uh, 2011 uh, for each service, and then we can add those all up uh, along the rows in various ways. Uh, <clears throat> now this next one is simply a summary of that table. 
uh, <clears throat> that's still complicated, but we can we can interpret this, I think. So here we have uh, the different biomes in the first column. Um, <clears throat> then there's the area in 1997 and the updated area in 2011. So a big part of the study had to do with um, <clears throat> estimating land use change over that time period uh, for the same biomes that we used in the 1997 study. And you can see the ones in um, in green are the um, areas that increase, the ones in red are the areas that decrease. And in general, the sort of higher valued systems are the ones that, that decrease at the expense of the, the lower valued systems. The next group of columns are the, the estimates of the, um, the value per hectare per year across the 17 different uh, services. Um, <clears throat> and um, again, the green numbers are the ones where the estimates have gone up and the red ones where they have gone down. In general, almost all of them have gone up. And the ones that have gone down were already very highly valued systems that didn't go down by a very large uh, percentage. So as we learned more, as we, as we suspected <clears throat> in 1997 when we did the paper, as we learned more about these systems, um, we expected that their, their estimated values would, would go up because they hadn't been thoroughly studied. Um, and we expect that trend to continue. <clears throat> and what we can do with that is to then estimate the, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the total values by multiplying the areas times the unit values. And we can do that in two different ways. The first column here, several different ways. The first column is the original values with the 1997 unit values and the 1997 areas. The second column is the, if we change unit values only and just um, <clears throat> leave the area the same. Um, then we could see just what the, in, the, the change in unit values, how does that change the estimate of the, of the total. And you can see the total down here of 45.9 is in, now in 2007 dollars rather than um, whatever we used in the 97 paper. I think it was 1994 dollars, so it's just for, adjusted for inflation. Um, <clears throat> but that goes up to 145 trillion a year if we just update the unit values. If we only change the area, that's the third column, um, then that number goes down from 45.9 to 41.6 trillion dollars. So we've, you know, by the land use change has actually decreased the value of all of those services that are provided by about 4.3 trillion dollars per year. That's column F. This is the difference between those two columns. However, if we use the, the um, um, if we change both the unit values and the area, you get the last column here. And so that, <clears throat> that gives us a total of 124.8 trillion. And we can take the difference between uh, this second column and the last column, and that gives us an estimate of $20.2 trillion per year as the loss of services, incorporating both the updated unit values and the estimate of the change in area. Uh, so I think this is our <clears throat> probably our, our best estimate. And again, it's an estimate with a capital E, as you can see from some of the underlying uncertainties that go into all of this, uh, but still gives us you know, sort of a ballpark of what um, the magnitude of the, the loss of natural of value of natural capital has been over this time period um, due to land use change. So <clears throat> let's see. And this is a map that shows the um, the distribution of those um, uh, ecosystem services over the planet based on the 2011 land area and uh, the 2011 unit values. Let's see, next one. So <clears throat> um, I wanted to also just touch on uh, some of the other uses for this valuation of ecosystem services. Um, and uh, this is a company called TrueCost, which estimates the external environmental costs by company um, and uses some of these estimates that I've been talking about uh, to, to uh, convert those into, into monetary units. So they can, for uh, <clears throat> all of the traded companies uh, in the U.S. and the U.K. at least, uh, estimate both the internal cost but also the external cost in, in terms of their impact both directly from their own company's operations and also through the whole supply chain, uh, their impacts on, on health and, and ecosystem services. Um, <clears throat> this, these estimates have been used by companies like Puma to create a, 
an environmental profit and loss statement um, that helps them to understand, you know, where are their environmental impacts really coming from all the way down the supply chain? How could they actually reduce those those impacts by redesigning and resourcing uh, some of their some of their products? Um, <clears throat> the T group, uh, in collaboration with True Cost, has recently estimated uh, the uh, primary production and processing sectors uh, external costs, so their impacts on natural capital, and estimated that they totaled about $7.3 trillion per year. So just from those primary production and processing sectors, but it's possible um, <clears throat> to estimate um, you know, these, the uh, full cost of our companies and, and products these days and uh, this idea. And the value of ecosystem services is really important to getting those estimates out. Um, <clears throat> for the purposes of the ELD, it's very important to understand how uh, changes in land use, and, and especially agricultural land use, can affect ecosystem services. And this is from a paper by John Foley um, and, and others uh, back in 2005, just shows the relationship between the range of services that you would get from a natural ecosystem um, very little in the way of crop production, but high values uh, for the other services. Uh, compared to a intensive cropland, where you have a lot of crop production and very low values for the other services. And um, you know what we might want to design going forward is a more integrated kind of cropping system uh, that gives us both high levels of crop production and high levels of all of these ecosystem services. And since agriculture is such a large fraction of land use on the planet these days, if we can improve the production of services from that cropland <clears throat> while still maintaining crop production, uh, we, could, we could really improve uh, the, the situation and maybe recover uh, some of that $20 trillion a year loss that we've, um, that we've uh, <clears throat> caused over the last several um, uh, decades between 1997 and 2011. Um, Another way of, of using these services is for um, land use planning and scenario analysis. And this is a paper by Ian Bateman and others that came out of the uh, UK Ecosystem Services Assessment recently, where they <coughs> investigated these six different scenarios uh, for, uh, for Britain um, <coughs> that looked at uh, different uh, environmental regulation and planning policies and the different spatial focusing of, of changes and you can sort of interpret from the names of these what uh, what they're what they're they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> so the you know nature at work and green and pleasant land uh, have uh, <clears throat> better environmental policies versus the world markets, which has weak environmental regulation, uh, etc. So it's possible. And I think the ELD project would be very involved in doing this at several different scales to generate uh, scenarios, which we can then evaluate in terms of their their ecosystem service and, and uh, economic production implications. Um, the UK study <clears throat> um, analyzed traditional agricultural production and then these um, three major ecosystem services, uh, carbon sequestration, recreation, and urban green space, and also compared that with biodiversity. So they didn't, they didn't get everything into the uh, <clears throat> into the analysis, but just these major ones. And by doing that, um, this is just two of those six scenarios that could compare the world markets and nature at work uh, in terms of the market value of the uh, agricultural products, uh, but then also the non-market values of the greenhouse gas sequestration, recreation, and urban um, amenities. Uh, and then also they compared that with um, the uh, biodiversity impacts. And the bottom line from this was that <clears throat> um, can interpret this little chart. The, uh, uh, the first column here is if the policies were to maximize the marketed agricultural values only. Uh, you can see that the market agricultural value uh, was relatively high, but other ecosystem services uh, suffered. And if you look at the total, 892, um, compared with <clears throat> a strategy that maximized all of those values, all of the the, uh, both the marketed and non-marketed uh, uh, services. You can see that the agricultural products uh, went down, but the other services went up by a lot more. And so 
there was you know, an order of magnitude larger value in the system uh, <clears throat> going forward if one took into account all of those ecosystem services. And I think this is the, just the kind of analysis that uh, the ELD project would be in, involved with. How do we understand uh, land degradation, but also land restoration? How do we, how do we recreate uh, a system that improves the value of these ecosystem services and gets them back, uh, back on track? Um, you can do this <clears throat> uh, in a number of different ways. This is one study that we did for agriculture in Iowa. We looked at a range of different uh, scenarios uh, for uh, some of the heartland agricultural area in the US uh, <clears throat> that, that changed not only the ecosystem services, but also many of the community services. One of the things that farmers are really concerned with, uh, with the mechanization and industrialization of agriculture is the loss of uh, farm communities. And uh, I think that that also would be a, a, a benefit that needs to be brought into the, the analysis. We did another study using scenarios for the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef in, in Australia and its catchment um, <clears throat> based on a, a number of different uh, uncertainties about climate change and regional land use policies. Uh, and from that analysis, we could, um, we could estimate the impacts on the uh, coral cover uh, for the Great Barrier Reef, uh, from linking that with some sophisticated modeling studies. And based on that, we can estimate the changes in, come on, it's a bit of a time lag here between when I click the button, there we go. Um, <clears throat> we can estimate the, uh, the changes in not only the ecosystem services produced, this sort of the top group, uh, but also the impacts of, on various other uh, components of human well-being. Um, and, uh, and down at the bottom, then we can estimate not only a sort of economic indicator, if we just look at the effects on the quantity of built infrastructure and the population, uh, you can see that uh, the sort of <clears throat> trashing the common scenario had the highest value there, but the lowest value in terms of the overall well-being if you include ecosystem services. So similar results, I think, coming out of many of these studies, like the UK study uh, and this one. As we begin to incorporate the value of ecosystem services, we begin to understand the real benefits of restoring the landscape. Um, this is um, from the Millennium Assessment as well, just showing that you know, when we make the conversion from intact ecosystems to, uh, to other types of land use, often there's a net loss in, in value of those, of those services. Uh, you know, we go from uh, intensive cropping uh, to, to uh, more natural systems. We, we've lost a lot of that value. We estimated <coughs> a few years ago the benefit-cost ratio of, of this, a scenario where we increase the global uh, reserve network to 15% of the terrestrial biosphere and 30% of the marine biosphere. That would cost about $45 uh, billion a year to create and maintain, but the net benefits the difference between the intact system and what we might convert it to would be on the order of four to five trillion dollars a year. So a benefit cost ratio of 100 to one, which is a very good investment. Um, and I think those are the kinds of, of analyses that we want to come out of the ELD project as well. What is the, the real benefit cost ratio from society's point of view uh, for uh, stopping land de degradation and, and, uh, and restoring uh, the landscape? Um, <clears throat> Uh, we, we can also take this further and do more integrated kinds of systems models of ecosystem services. And this is one that we did back in 2002, and it's mentioned in the uh, GEC paper. Um, and by incorporating all of these complex dynamic feedbacks in the system, we estimated that the value of those services was significantly higher, actually, than we did in the, as a percentage or as a, in relation to GDP. Uh, than we did in the static analysis and the simple benefit um, transfer approach. Uh, so I think there's a lot of room for improvement of these analyses as we begin to build more complex models. I know you probably can't see any of this, but this is just a list of um, <clears throat> many of the, the modeling tools and analytical tools that are now being developed out there uh, to assess ecosystem services in a more spatially explicit, more dynamic ways. Um, <clears throat> this is one of those is a system called MIMES, Multi-Scale Integrated Models of Ecosystem Services. 
uh, that I and colleagues have been working on that's intended to give a easy to use but fairly sophisticated system to analyze um, ecosystem services and policies for changing land use and those services over time. So ultimately I think this is the kind of tool that, uh, that we need to provide to allow uh, the sort of sophisticated but easy to apply analysis of these services at, at, uh, at multiple scales uh, all the way from uh, small watersheds to whole countries to the, to the whole global scale. Um, <clears throat> another approach that we're working on, oh yeah, this is, this is just a, uh, an example that I thought was interesting to throw in of uh, the, the, the Maya civilization where we were able to model historically uh, <clears throat> the reasons for the collapse of the Maya civilization and how they depended on uh, the contribution of ecosystem services and how that interacted with growing populations and growing trade networks and how that uh, <clears throat> caused a loss of resilience to the, the uh, periodic drought cycles that they experienced and a collapse of that civilization. What we can learn from those kinds of studies are the kinds of things that we might do to prevent those kinds of collapses. You know, how do we make sure that we've, uh, we're not exceeding uh, the, the safe operating space of the system? Um, <clears throat> and this sort of integrated modeling can help us do that. And finally, I think we can begin to do some even more interesting things to get uh, <clears throat> uh, more people interested in interacting with this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of study. And we've been working uh, with creating, uh, engaging, and interesting games for people to play uh, to, to lay on top of these landscape models and to use that, uh, the, those uh, people playing the games, not only as entertainment, but also uh, for research purposes and for education purposes. So <clears throat> we're hoping to build <coughs> what we're calling integrated models or integrated games uh, that can take advantage of the fact that you know, there are over 3 billion hours a week currently being spent by people playing computer games. We can get some of them to play these games that about how to manage landscapes and how, how to understand the trade-offs among ecosystem services and we can keep track of every decision that they make in these games and begin to use that to understand how they value these resources, how their, how their the valuation changes as they learn more about uh, how those, those resources interact with each other and, and also as a byproduct educate people about what ecosystem services are and, uh, and how, they, how important they are to people's lives. So, Thanks very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for a great uh, presentation. Um, I would love to see the game at some point. See you how can be a, you can be a beta tester. Oh yes, I'm, I'd be happy to. <laughs> that would be great uh, to see how. Uh, that uh, works. Uh, we would have time for a couple of questions now from uh, the participants. Um, the, our Carlos from the GSZ team is asking whether participants may be recorded. No, they may not. Uh, but we can switch off the recording in between. And so uh, we open the floor to sessions, uh, to questions. Uh, so anybody who would like to raise a question, please raise your hand by clicking on that little hand on top of the screen on the very left side. We've, you see that. Uh, hand, and then I will open your microphone. Um, you can raise your hand, click on that hand um, on top of the screen, left side, and I will open your microphone. But uh, meanwhile, let me ask you this question. You talked about a, a benefit to cost ratio of 100 to 1. What would you think is the main reason that not every government in the world is eager to do that, to, to change to a um, best of both worlds policy, uh, seeing that cost uh, yes. benefit ratio? 
Well, I think the main reason is that those benefits are public benefits, and the costs and um, um, you know the costs are private costs. So um, you know the the uh, when you convert an area to um, to farming, you know the individual farmers can reap the private benefits, and, uh, but they're they're not <clears throat> they're not paying the uh, public costs. So it's that distinction between private and public benefits and costs that. Uh, that makes those investments so hard to do, but that's in fact what governments should be doing: uh, is to better understand, you know, where those public investments can really pay off with public benefits. Um, part of the problem is that those public benefits don't get measured uh, adequately in national income accounts, and you know, all of the, the things that are kind of driving our policies. They don't go into GDP. Uh, <clears throat> so I think there's a real need for. Um, <clears throat> better measures of, of social progress, uh, you know, beyond GDP. Uh, so there's, you know, things like the um, the genuine progress indicator and, and uh, several other alternatives uh, that can begin to fold in those those positive values. And I think if we uh, uh, if we can do that, we can begin to show the, you know that, that show governments that those investments really can pay off. And I think actually that's one of the things that the ELD project can really uh, provide uh, is just that kind of information of where these investments would be really good because another reason I think they're not undertaken as much is that uh, um, <clears throat> the governments don't really know that they exist. You know, they don't know that that's okay. that it's such a good return on investment. Uh, you have to point them out and um, I think once you do point them out they can, they can be quite effective. Um, you know, there, there are lots of examples like that, um, you know, like urban water supplies. Um, you know, the, the uh, city of New York is probably the most well-known example. Uh, New York City recently you know, was faced with having to build a, a very expensive water treatment plant uh, or protect the watershed and the Catskills, you know, to continue to provide the fresh water for the city. And it was much more cost-effective to protect the watershed than to build the the treatment plant. So, you know, using the natural capital assets that they had, um, mm -hmm. it was would be uh, uh, much better for them. But they had to, you know, basically be shown that that uh, that possibility, and the numbers had to be spun out you know, to show them that that was really a much better better option. Um, and I think there's there's just a, a huge number and a growing number of examples like that. But I think that's the reason why this kind of analysis is really so important. Mm -hmm. And um, here comes a question. Do you think the cost concept of ecosystem service uh, could still be relevant even without including an ec economic valuation? The well, chat <laughs> <laughs> um, that, I think that um, you know, some people argue that we we shouldn't or we can't actually value these services. And in fact, my response to that is that we actually are valuing them every day, every time we make a decision that affects uh, natural ecosystems. We're, we're implicitly valuing them. You know, you're making a trade-off. And so I think all you're really trying to do is to make that, <clears throat> that uh, trade-off more explicit and begin to understand what all of the implications are. Now, as I've said, how you um, express that, those trade-offs, what units you express them in, is a matter of, of some choice and it's somewhat arbitrary and it really depends on what communicates better. Uh, so, you know, the, and when you say these values are economic values, I think you have to use that term in a very broad way. You know, they're, they're contributions to human well-being. Uh, now, if you want to call those economic values, I guess that's that's up to you. But I would rather say those are you know contributions to well-being that are expressed in monetary units, um, but they could be expressed in other units as well. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> okay, we can take more questions in the chat. Um, so if you want to raise the questions, put it in the chat. Um, 
But meanwhile, um, what would you think? You've done a lot of uh, analysis of present uh, of the present time and even of histor uh, history, Maya um, history. What 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 uh, is your uh, prediction for let's say hundred years from now? What do you th would you think it will be the state of the of ecosystem services around the world? Well, I think that depends a lot on what kind of choices we make you know, in, the, in the coming years. And I think this whole idea of uh, scenario planning is sort of one way to get at that. I don't know if, if uh, you remember the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Um, they had a large section in there about uh, four scenarios for the future, mm -hmm. depending on how we, how we begin to take on board these ideas. You know, if we continue with a business as usual philosophy going forward, or if we take a philosophy that's more uh, open to um, these ecosystem services and how valuable they are and the kinds of you know, um, uh, policies that, that that would lead to. So it, it could go in a number of, of ways. Um, and um, you know, it's, I think it's impossible to predict the future, but I think we can create the future if we uh, you know, are conscious of what these choices are and the kind of world that we really want. And I think one of the missing elements in our whole discussion these days is is this discussion about uh, just that. What kind of future uh, do we really want? How do we envision that future and how do we um, build some consensus and share share our visions on it? Um, <clears throat> we have a book that just came out um, that's titled Creating a Sustainable and Desirable Future. That's a collection of essays from 45 different authors about just what that those positive futures could look like. You know, what do those world, what, the, what would a world look like where, where those, uh, <clears throat> you know, all of the ideas that we're talking about were incorporated. The, um, the UN is also involved right now in the uh, developing the sustainable development goals. And so they're putting together a set of goals for the world that, you know, if they were all um, <clears throat> reached simultaneously, I think would create a world that was uh, both sustainable and, and desirable. And I think there's a real chance that that, that process could uh, could really have some, some impact on the, the policies of governments going forward as we begin to realize that you know human well-being is is much more than than uh, just GDP growth, and in fact that that's getting in the way in a lot of countries. I guess that's a very nice wrap up for today's session. Yes. Uh, okay. There's uh, one more question. I don't want to uh, uh, miss those. Uh, there's this question from Andre. Do you h know how is how the concept being picked up in spatial planning at lower scales? Is it being integrated in spatial plans? Are spatial planners aware of the concept and its benefits? Um, well, I think it is being picked up and implemented. I'm not sure I could say exactly how broadly, but I know that, uh, that, <clears throat> that uh, it certainly can be quite effective and, and useful in, um, in spatial planning. Uh, at, <clears throat> at urban scales, at regional scales, at country scales. You know, so the, UK study that I that I uh, that I mentioned uh, would be one you know at the country scale that could be useful for for spatial planning. But I think, in fact, <clears throat> it is a very useful concept, and I, I uh, and I think it is being picked up much more broadly. Um, I should put in a plug before I go for the um, the next meeting of the Ecosystem Services Partnership which is a global organization uh, devoted to you know, linking together practitioners and scientists uh, around ecosystem services. It will be held in San Jose, Costa Rica uh, from the 8th to the 12th of, of September. And there will be a, a couple of sessions on the, uh, the ELD at, the, at that conference. So uh, <clears throat> I hope uh, some of you are already planning to go. And if not, uh, you, should, you should take a look. And if you, if you do go, I'll see you there. Okay, thank you. So all of you have the chance to go to San Jose, Costa Rica. I had the chance to meet Bob Costanza there. Thank you, Bob, for this great presentation on the global values of ecosystem services. Uh, thank you very much. Next week's 
speaker will be Nicola Favretto, uh, talking about uh, Kalahari Graceland's. And um, so I guess it's uh, time to say good night, Bob. Good. Uh, Australia is already 11 o'clock at night. So uh, thank you very much and bye-bye to you all and see you next week in Nicola Favretto's um, presentation on uh, Kalahari uh, farmland. Okay, thank you very much and bye-bye. Okay, bye Claudia. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.